Hello everyone and welcome to Sarah TV again in New York City. As promised, we are bringing you from Ghana on on Ghana Professor uh, uh, Professor Ayite who is going to talk to us. Actually, Professor Ayite is here in the US. He is going to talk to us about the demise of the Ghanaian president uh, last week and what is what happened and how Ghana was able easily uh, able to overcome you know the transition and uh, and the death of the president as opposed to what we had in nigeria where cabal hijacked power for several months and made it impossible for the nigerian people to have any form of transition hello professor ayiti hello uh you're Thank welcome you the, la the last time we had you here we you were talking about nigeria uh, as a matter of fact uh, you pissed off some nigerians and uh, they were asking you at that time talk about ghana how did it happen that you didn't know that your president was going to die? I mean, this has been sick for a while. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think most people uh, in Ghana knew that the president was, you know, not well. And he had been suffering from mature cancer uh, for a long time. In fact, uh, it's speculated that he was suffering from, I think, 2008. Even before the elections in 2008, uh, he had to make a dash to South Africa for medical treatment. Hmm. And also, I was there for, you know, almost seven months, and uh, I really saw him in public. And uh, in June, he had to travel to the U.S., you know, uh, for treatment, but it was officially termed, you know, routine medical checkup. Everybody knew that, you know, the president was not well, but uh, his handlers, you know, uh, were telling a different story. And uh, a lot of people, including myself, knew that he wouldn't be able to make it through the uh, election campaign because it would be too much for him. I, and, and personally, I, don't, I didn't think he himself had, you know, the will or the appetite to run for a second term, uh, knowing his demeanor and also his disposition. Uh, but I guess, you know, there were these handlers who were sort of pushing him and pushing him and pushing him because of their own selfish agenda, you know. Uh, uh, to further their own mess. And this is one of the sad things about, you know, uh, the death of our president, Atamel. Did, did, um, did you know this president very well? Were you close to him? Did you advise him? Oh, I didn't advise him. Uh, I know him. I've met him uh, a couple of times. And, uh, I mean, he's a very affable man. He, he's, you know, he, he, he's, he's very well read. He's very intelligent. And, you know, I, I say this uh, as, uh, as knowing as a person and not as a politician. Of course, I may disagree with some of his political views and uh, policies, but as a person, I very, very much like him. As a matter of fact, my sister is, uh, is serving in this administration as a Minister of Environment, Science and Technology. And uh, <clears throat> two years ago, when my mother died, uh, he knew my mother, so we have to go and, you know, inform him of the news, and he graciously uh, offered his condolences. So personally, I have nothing against him. I very much like him. Uh, I mean, he's the uh, your usual gentle uh, professor with a bomb for me, and uh, he has a very uh, determined sense of humor. He's a, he's a very good man, you know. Uh, but of course, his politics is totally different. And, uh, yeah, Let, let's uh, talk well, about. I mean, let's before we go into his politics and his legacy, let's talk about Africa. I mean, the president of Ethiopia is currently sick. The president of Zimbabwe is sick. Uh, almost all of these uh, dictators are sick in some ways, either you know physically or they are sick upstairs. You know what is what is wrong with uh, you know putting sick people in power in Africa and especially hiding it from the public who should know if these guys are physically or mentally okay? Why 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 is that? Why do Africans well, always love to put you know you know invalid people in power? I mean, or keep them in power. Yeah, well, you know, I wouldn't put Professor, uh, President Atanus in the same category as uh, dictators like, you know, um, Melizinafi of Zimbabwe, of Ethiopia, and Mugabe of uh, Zimbabwe. But, you know, uh, the thing is, um, uh, you know, they, they, they grow to be, yeah, you know, uh, they, they grow into the old age and then they fall sick. Uh, but the thing is, you know, the, the striking thing is, and this is different about President Atanus. That you know, he didn't die in a foreign hospital. You know, he died in you know uh, a military hospital in Ghana. Whereas you know, the other person, the go abroad, you know, uh, for 
uh, for medical treatment and so forth. But, you know, in general, um, I would say that, you know, somebody has made a mention, has made note of the fact that, you know, dictators just lump at that, you know, civilian president. And, uh, uh, but I think, you know, it's, it's just, you know, uh, coincidence or, you know, a natural way of ordering things. Uh, but, you know, eventually we will all go, but it depends upon how we go. Yeah, so let's talk about his legacy, you know, I mean, from what we're getting from Ghana, it uh, looks like uh, he's a fairly well-loved man or president. Uh, what did he do different that made people kind of uh, have a lot of sympathy for him? Oh, it, um, I mean, uh, you know, it's just general African character and tradition that when somebody is not well, you know, everybody will wish him. Uh, uh, well, you know, uh, speedy recovery and that sort of thing. And Ghanaians knew that, you know, the president wasn't well. Um, so it wasn't anything to say that he did, you know, that, uh, and in the sympathy of Ghanaians, we already knew. And uh, we also knew that he was uh, sort of fighting many demons. Uh, first of all, you know, it was, it was the Council of the Truth, which sort of incapacitated him. And um, and secondly, you know, he was also fighting Jerry Rollins, you know. Jerry Rollins, you know, if you may remember, he used to be the former head of uh, president of... Yeah, that, that's president. true. I mean, someone described Jerry Rollins as a cancer on his own and inside Ghanaian politics. Do you agree? Uh, uh, describe him as what? As a cancer within Ghanaian politics. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, since President Atamus, you know, became president in uh, 2009, Rawlings has been sniping at his uh, at his feet, you know, uh, constantly, and uh, uh, he uh, sort of uh, said the Mills administration is full of uh, you know greedy bastards. You know that was the the term that he used, and full of greedy bastards and crass criminals, and that the NDC has lost its moral uh, principles of integrity, dignity, and uh, accountability, and was was heading towards it. Uh, you know, into a towards a ditch, and that uh, the NDC might lose this uh, this year's election. In fact, after he died, um, uh, President was very, very, very unkind in saying that uh, if Hatta Mills had done um, had done things wiser, you know, he would have uh, lived an extra three or four months. You know, this is not the type of you know comments that you make. You know, after somebody said, you know. Yes. So uh, let's go into his legacy. You say you did, he didn't do anything different. I mean, this is a period of unprecedented oil wealth in Ghana. Ghana is beginning to receive money from oil, and and he's uh, he's the president. Did he manage the resources very well so far? You know, is it not true in some ways that uh, maybe uh, Mr. Uh, the former president, uh, Rollins, was right by saying that they were greedy bastards because we have already started hearing of uh, uh, corruption within the Ghanaian society, that people are already taking away oil wet and stealing and, uh, you know, becoming millionaires overnight. Yeah, uh, that may well be true, but, you know, I don't think uh, uh, the, that criticism, you know, doesn't really apply to President Atamus because, you see, the man was not in control, okay? The man was not well. Uh, you know, you might characterize him as, you know, an absentee president. As far as it was his minions, so, you know, Angus on who were running the show. It wasn't him. And uh, for a long time, you know, we, we, we really never saw him in public. So, you see, if something went wrong, you really can't lay it at the feet of uh, President Matandos, but rather, uh, you know, his uh, advisors and uh, subordinates. Well, let, let's, let's put it this way. If, if he knew that he's not capable of running Ghana, why not resign if, if you are so incapacitated that, you know, you have to leave the country to be managed by uh, people that Rollins describes as uh, greedy bastards, and uh, you don't seem to disagree a lot with that. Why didn't he resign? Why didn't he well, say, look, you know, you know time to go, hand this over to another person who is competent, who is healthy enough? That is where I'm a little worried that, uh, you know, he's not taking responsibility for his actions. Oh, you know, that, okay, uh, you may argue that way, but I think, you know, uh, knowing him, you know, the way I do, you know, yeah. I probably would have said that, you know, President Atomius would have remained a long time ago. But, you know, there are people, uh, there, were, there, there are people around him, okay, who were pushing him. 
Okay, because, you know, like I said, you know, they wanted to set their own personal agenda. They wanted him there. As far as, as a matter of fact, they knew that the man was not well, and yet they pushed him. In fact, when he came to uh, the U.S. Uh, for medical treatment and re returned to Ghana, they forced him to jog, you know, uh, on the uh, airport camera. You know, they took decisions without his knowledge. Okay? Mm. So there were some people, you know, I call them, you know, patronage junkies or even maggots, you know, who have sort of wormed their way into the state bureaucracy. And they were taking there because, you know, it served their agenda. They didn't care about the health of the president. They didn't care about, you know, whether he was, you know, fit or, you know, well or not. It was their agenda. So this is why, you know, even if the president was willing to resign, uh, those people around him will have blocked it. You know, and this is something which, you know, uh, uh, went to a moment that I didn't like at all. Because the, the Constitution says that the president is incapac incapacitated. You know, his, his function should be passed on to the vice president. The vice president was there. He could have taken over. But the, the hangers on, the people around him, surrounding president, was not allow that to happen. So let me ask uh, Professor Yite, what do you think was responsible for a very tr smooth transition in Ghana? You know, the president died, I mean, in the after, I mean, early in the morning or after, you know, early afternoon, I would say, I, I, I don't, they said 2 p.m., right? This was early mm -hmm. afternoon. By 8 p.m., you had a new president in Ghana, you know, and Ghana seems to have moved on smoothly and fairly well. And it seems like uh, this was uh, some kind of institutional piece of transition. What do you think was responsible? Because uh, when Nigeria had a similar uh, uh, circumstance, uh, it was different. Yeah, I think, <coughs> uh, you know, that's no transition, the peace and the smooth uh, transition of uh, transfer of power. Uh, it's what I would add, you know, attribute uh, ascribe as the uh, real legacy of uh, President Atta Mills. Because, see, he was a man of uh, peace, and he was also a man who believed in the rule of law. As a matter of fact, he saved Ghana. Uh, in my view, he saved Ghana in 2000. Uh, uh, in 2000, and he saw the saved Ghana again. You know, and I don't think everybody who knew uh, President Atta Mills uh, would have affirmed that he would not have liked any chaotic transition after him. Because, you know, he likes to do things in an orderly manner. And uh, so that was, you know, uh, what the smooth transition was really, you know, a tribute to his own legacy. And, uh, you know, when that happened, you know, the, the the Speaker of the House, you know, you also have the Chief Justice, you know, the Supreme Court or the Supreme Court. Uh, they knew what the Constitution, you know, required, you know, and they did their job. So let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, Dramani. Mahama, uh, do you think he's capable of leading Ghana through this period of transition? And uh, is he a good candidate for his party coming uh, December elections? Oh, yeah. I think, you know, John Mahama is a man of, you know, good standing, you know, and integrity. A lot of people respect him. As a matter of fact, I have met him. He's just re recently wrote a book. And, uh, I, I mean, uh, and he also speaks his mind. You know, one of the things which... Uh, when I was in Ghana, he impressed me a lot about him. Uh, was that he, he was not afraid uh, uh, to take on the government itself. You know, he uh, uh, lambasted, you know, uh, the state bureaucracy, saying that the state bureaucracy was slow, inefficient, and also riddled with corruption. And so forth. He was the one who said so. Uh, he was the vice president. So he he uh, he is something. Uh, he is somebody that you know. In a way, you know, he was, you know, bringing in a breath of fresh air, you know, into governance. And um, he's also somebody who is very, very capable uh, of managing the affairs of, of this. I have no worries about him at all. Professor George Ayite, lastly, well, the last time we spoke to you was about Nigeria. You heard that uh, last week uh, they arranged some of the oil subsidy or fuel subsidy thieves in Nigeria for the $6.8 billion uh, dollars fraud. Are you now satisfied that Nigeria is fighting corruption? Um, you know, I hope that, you know, they don't arrest them and then release them. Uh, you hope they don't arrest um, and release them? Yeah, I hope they don't do that, you know, uh, because, look, uh, a lot of things need to be done differently in Nigeria in terms of following the Constitution. 
Section uh, 308, for example, of the Constitution grants immunity, you know, uh, to the, you know, president, vice president, state and governance and deputies and so forth. All that thing needs to be stripped away. Now remember that, you know, if you, if you take somebody like Peter Obori, you know, it was, uh, it's been caught in London, not that thing, you know, uh, sort of indicting and arresting these, you know, state governors. And, um, in the case of Peter Obori, for example, his case came up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court judge set him free. Uh, you may remember that the Economic, Financial, and EFCC Commission uh, arrested him. And then, you know, a, a, a Supreme Court judge, a Supreme Court judge, you know, said it. And that is why I'm saying that, you know, when they are they arrest these thieves, you know, uh, then subsequently there's some backroom dealings and so forth. And then all of a sudden they are free. And I hope this time around it doesn't happen. Head your bet before you go. Who is winning in Ghana in the December election between Jerry? Ro I mean, Jerry Rollins party and the, the I mean the NDC, which is Atamil's party, right, and the other party. Uh -huh. who, do you, who do you think is uh -huh. going to win? Oh, I doubt whether you know the Atamil's party will win. You doubt uh, if they will yeah. win? I doubt it. You wow. Know. Um, because you know, um, uh, there are several things uh, going on. Uh, the least of it is a speed of corruption scandals, and I'm sure that you've heard about yeah. you know, uh, them, you know, judgment, that, you know, settlement and so forth. Uh, there's, you know, the celebrated case, you know, Wyoming. Uh, here's an individual who was a self-proclaimed uh, financier of the ruling party who uh, was awarded, you know, $31 million in judgment uh, debt. Uh, for uh, the abrogation of a contract which he claimed he had, but apparently he didn't have any contract with the government. Or the, the, so then, you know, then another and then another, you know, there's a speed of corruption. Yeah. And secondly, um, you see, the margin of victory uh, by uh, Professor, uh, the, the margin of victory uh, by uh, President Atamil's party in the last election in 2008 was very, very, very small. It was only by 40,000 votes. Hmm. And uh, since then, that, you know, 40,000 votes, you know, have been whittled away. Um, so it will be very, very difficult um, for the ruling party, you know, to uh, to win the election. The third factor is Rawlings. Uh, you may remember that his own wife has set up, you know, a new party, which is literally splintered. Uh, the ruling NDC party. His wife now has, you know, set up a party called the National Democratic uh, Party, NDP. Hmm. So the NDC uh, vote is really split. So it's very, very difficult for them, you know, for the NDC at uh, Donald Trump's party to, uh, to win the December election. As a matter of fact, uh, the President Donald Trump, when he was alive, tried very, very hard to see if he can mend fences with the Rawlingses, but that did not succeed. So uh, there's, you know, there's much trouble for the uh, NBC in the uh, December election. Well, Prof, thank you so much for coming on our show. We will be talking to you as the Ghanaian election approaches, and if there's anything uh, uh, that you will be talking about again on Nigeria, we'll be monitoring you on Twitter. We, we, we always love to hear from you, and thank you for taking our time to be on Sarah TV today.